live and in person from the 92nd Street Wise stage in Kaufman Concert Hall, welcome to the latest installment of our civic series, Race to City Hall. I'm Seth Pinsky, the CEO of the 92nd Street Y, and I'm honored to be here to host compelling, substantive conversations with leading candidates from some, for some of New York City's top elective offices, moderated by esteemed political journalists from City and State New York and PIX11, our media partners. In a few moments, we'll hear from those running for New York City controller. Each of them will be joining us live in our theater today to take questions, sharing their visions for the future of our city. Thank you to all of them for being here. As most of you are likely aware, the controller of the city of New York is the city's chief financial officer and auditor. The controller oversees a staff of 800 people and among other responsibilities is charged with reviewing all city contracts, handling the settlement of city litigation, issuing municipal bonds, and managing the city's pension funds with an astounding $240 billion in assets as of 2020. While the role of controller is always an important one, it's in particularly important now. This is because unquestionably, we're going through one of the most difficult periods in our city's history, a period during which we're simultaneously seeking to confront longstanding injustices, ensure the health and safety of our fellow New Yorkers, and revive an economy that has been decimated across nearly all sectors. This is especially true for the arts, cultural, and educational sector, the sector of which we at the 92nd Street Y are a part. We're therefore eager to hear from the candidates to gain a better understanding of who they are and what they plan to do to revitalize this incredibly complex place we all call home. And so, without further ado, let's get today's conversation going. To tell us more about the format for these conversations and to introduce our moderators, I'd like to welcome Ralph Ortega, Editor-in-Chief of City and State, to the stage. Thank you, Seth. Welcome candidates to the 92nd Street Y, and hello to all the viewers watching online to our Comptroller Election Forum. I'm Ralph Ortega. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of City and State New York, and I'm thrilled to be finally in person in the beautiful Kaufman Concert Hall. Before we explain the rules of the forum and introduce our moderators, on behalf of City and State New York, I want to take a moment to thank our partners, the 92nd Street Y and PIX11, for your collaboration on this series. First, I will explain the format, which all the candidates have agreed to in advance of today's event. Each candidate will be invited up on stage, one at a time, and engage in conversation with our moderators for approximately 10 minutes. With one minute remaining, candidates will be issued a time warning and asked to deliver a closing statement. Once time is up, we will bring on the next candidate. Our co-moderators for today's event are City and State New York's Jeff Colton and PIX11's James Ford. Both have storied careers in political reporting and have been closely following New York City's elections. We're lucky to have them here to guide the conversation. The questions were designed by the moderators and they incorporated themes submitted by 92nd Street Y patrons in advance of the events. Jeff Colton is a senior reporter at City and State with a particular focus on New York City. Jeff previously worked at New York One and at Bronx-based public radio station WFUV. He's an experienced reporter for print and web and has often represented City and State in forums, debates, and other online and live events. Jeff graduated in 2015 from Fordham University where he studied political science and theology. Both uh, born and raised in Phoenix, Jeff now lives in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. James Ford is an Emmy Award-winning journalist at PIX11. Since joining PIX in 2007, he has served as a lead live reporter for the PIX11 Morning News and covered breaking news and feature stories. Prior to, his, prior to this, he worked at stations across the country, including WNYW, Fox 5 here in New York, WTOC-TV in Savannah, Georgia, WFTV in Orlando, Florida, and WRTV in Indianapolis. James and his family live in Manhattan, and he is a graduate of Yale University and the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. Thank you both for being here. Now let's welcome the candidates attending today's forum in person. New York State Senator Brian Benjamin, Michelle Caruso Cabrera, Zach Iskall, New York City Council Speaker Corey Johnson, 
New York City Council member Brad Lander, Terry Lifton, New York State Senator Kevin Parker, Reshma Patel, and New York Assembly member David Weppern. Thank you to the candidates for coming in person to answer our questions, and we hope you enjoy the presentation. James and Jeff, take it away. And thank you very much. Uh, let's get right to it, shall we? Uh, yeah, we man. start with New York State Senator Brian Benjamin. Thanks for joining us, Senator. Glad to be here. And it's great to see you in person. He was well. Glad to be here. <laughs> okay. Um, as we said, we jump right in. Let's do it. No, All right. 10 minutes. Uh, let's start. <laughs> the, uh, no, some past comptrollers have sure. had experience in finance, some sure. have not. You are currently a state senator. I will, in full disclosure, say you're my state senator for my district. Um, what professional background has you prepared for this job? Sure. So thank you for uh, this, the 92nd Street Y. I want to appreciate uh, you for having this forum because civics is so important. So let me say uh, briefly, you know, I uh, was a graduate of Brown University, Harvard Business School, and I spent a few years at Morgan Stanley where I did investment management in the private wealth department. And so I specifically have asset management experience and no other candidate running has that experience. And when you hear of 240 plus billion dollar pension fund and you are the chief investment officer of that responsible for the Bureau of Asset Management, it, I think it's relevant to have someone with that experience given the fact that last year our pension funds only returned 4.4 percent. The city actuary requires a 7 percent return and that meant the city had to spend more money in from the city budget to, to help the pension funds over $10 billion. We can go in the other direction and I have the experience to do it. But private wealth and public finance are two different things. Two different things. Uh, so let's be clear. When I say private wealth, I'm talking about managing the assets of the pension funds. The $250 billion, that has to be managed. Um, there's portfolio uh, allocation, asset allocation, uh, manager selection. That's what that is. Public finance has more to do with the city's borrowing and how we deal with the capital budget. That's a separate function. Um, but when it comes to the actual pension fund asset management, I'm the only person with experience as it relates to doing that before being uh, a candidate for New York City Comptroller. Now, you've conducted a lot of interviews uh, yes, running for this job. I've listened to a few of them. One thing that comes up constantly is your plan to convert unused hotels into affordable housing. Correct. Uh, the hotel sector right now, of course, is doing very poorly. But Correct. before that, my gosh, it was, it was on fire and prices were through the roof. I mean, Correct. they clearly demand was outpacing supply. So, you know, why now? Why would you want to convert hotels? Is this, is this just virtue signaling? talking about affordable housing, or is this actually the right way to handle the problem? So there's two issues. When I talk about converting the hotels, I'm really thinking about the homelessness problem. And by the way, if we're going to try to get out of this tourism uh, issue, two things need to be on the top of the table, public safety and our dealing with the homelessness issue, particularly mental health. And so what I'm saying is that we have hotels that are really in, in a tough position. The comptroller through the investments of the $250 billion pension fund can be part of an investment vehicle that would acquire and convert these hotels into either permanent housing or permanent supportive housing. And the reason why I say permanent housing, there are some people who live in the shelters, live on the street, who actually work. Uh, it's, it, it's not just all people who are in, in the destitute situation. There are some hardworking New Yorkers, people we see every day who are homeless. They deserve a place to live, and we can't afford to wait to, for the time it takes to produce the 600,000 units of affordable housing from scratch. So if there's an opportunity there, we can do that. And by the way, as you mentioned, the, ho the hotel uh, business is cyclical. So if we buy now on the downside, the value of that for the retirees, two of whom are my parents, 700,000 plus, will be phenomenal and you get the public benefit. Like I'm all about saying, let's use the pension assets to not only protect the retirees, but get a public benefit. Build, public affo build affordable housing where we can. Invest in our local entrepreneurs where, where we can. Help to rebuild the infrastructure. I know it's a more activist vision of the Comptroller's Office, but in this time coming out of COVID, it is the right way to go. You're still talking about you know, helping, I guess, during this hotel downturn. I mean, Correct. Is, is there a concern that tourism is not going to, to come right back this, this soon as tourism, this summer? Tourism, so if you listen to Tom DiNapoli's latest report, tourism is not going to really come back until 2025. Maybe it comes back sooner. 
my view is this year we're getting people vaccinated for COVID. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to get the industry going again. We have to bring the international tourists back. I need them in Harlem, as you know, uh, on, every, on any given Sunday, they literally make, make or break our commercial uh, 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 renters. I mean, you know, our, our restaurants need that. And as does Chinatown, Midtown, everywhere does. And so my view is let's get that business going again. But when, when the tourists come back, now we're going to have uh, uh, the support, we're going to have those those hotels that are now converted, but then there'll be more production of hotels. I'm not worried about uh, tourists having a place to stay when they come here. I am worried about the the homeless uh, problem we have in the city that we cannot seem to fix. And part of it is because we're just not being bold enough in how we're trying to address it. Now, as the 92nd Street Y uh, CEO, Mr. Pinsky, was pointing out, arts and culture a big part of the mission of this organization and definitely a big part of New York City. Absolutely. What role can the comptroller play in ensuring that the arts and culture sector, which has suffered a lot under the last year and change, that it can revitalize in a way that most benefits everyone? Well, part of it is detailing um, through, uh, through audits and reports exactly where we are. You know, one of the things I think the comptroller can play a very important role in is looking at how our revenue is going, where are we suffering? As you know, uh, you know, business uh, revenue has been down tremendously because of, because of COVID-19. And when you think about one of the reasons why people come to New York City, it's because of the arts and cultural sector period. So in order, f so it's, it's uniquely linked in, in this case to our economic prosperity. And so one of the things that I believe the comptroller has a very important role to play is, is really looking at how our arts and culture se sector, how is it doing? What are some of the issues? What are some of the key concerns? You know, as a senator, I spend a lot of time talking to those in the arts and cultures, cultural space about what can we be doing at the state level? The comptroller has the fiscal cap capacity to help and when you look at the fact that the comptroller registers all city contracts, we do a lot of activity and businesses with our, with our um, arts and cultural space. How we look to, to those investments, I think, make a, lot of, make a lot of sense and can matter for the future. I mean, are you saying you would, uh, as comptroller, maybe steer, uh, a better word might be, uh, designate maybe certain amounts of money to different arts and cultural institutions? I would like to work with the mayor. See, one of the things that I know is a dangerous thing to say is work with the mayor. I would like to work with the mayor to that end because I do believe we should be very clear about how the arts and cultural space has been hurt across the board. I don't think that it's, it's very obvious to the public sector. And then working with the mayor to say, let's steer uh, support and, 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 and uh, uh, grants and opportunities to uh, the arts and cultural space. We want to ask a couple of political questions. Sure. As you mentioned, the next he's, mayor. He's skeptical about that. I think we can do it. I oh, think we can do it. I think it. it depends on who the mayor is. I think it depends on who the comptroller is. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that I've seen, I, I know we know, one of the things that I think is important. I have, I'm chair of the Budget and Revenue Committee in the state. I have dealt with the governor, the mayor, and the fight in the back and forth, and the mayor and the comptroller and the fighting in the back and the forth. We don't have the time for that as we're trying to come out of COVID. We need them working on one accord. And I believe it takes leadership from the right people to do it. And I think the comptroller is the person who has the fiscal numbers, the chief accountability officer, the chief fiscal officer. This is the person to say, listen, we don't have time for the games. This is what the city needs to recover. And if we want New York City to be better than before, we have to work together. Sorry. Well, no, by all means, talking about the next mayor, uh, correct to say that you have not supported it. You're not endorsing an, another candidate. That is candidate. very correct to say, yes. You, uh, do you think there should be a divide, I guess, between the... Uh... I believe the comptroller's number one job is to hold the mayor and the city council accountable for all city spending. I believe when you look at education and you look at public safety, we need a comptroller who's going to be... And COVID recovery. We have $16 billion that's coming from the, from the federal government. Where is that money going? How are we ensuring that it's going towards recovery and, and non recurring expenses. One of the problems that I'm concerned about is, is this city council and this mayor deciding to take some of that $16 billion and invest in these long-term programs, but we're not going to have $16 billion coming in year two and year three and year four, and then we're going to have a big cliff. We have a huge budget gap. This is what I deal with in the state all the time. We need to make sure that all the money that's coming in that is one time goes to one time expenses, recovery. Let's get our kids who've been lost for a year, who haven't been on broadband, haven't been in school. Let's get them 
educated. Let's do the things we need to do to help them, to help them function and then ensure that our budget, because that's an extraordinary item, make sure that our budget has recurring revenues with recurring expenses. And let's be smooth with that. Anyway, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. No, by all means. Look, uh, we <laughs> have just a minute left, so uh, we do want to give all of our candidates a chance for a, a closing statement to touch upon things that maybe that we haven't asked about. So uh, take it away. The floor is yours. Listen, I, thank you for this. And I think the comptroller is a, one of the less known positions, but is one of the most important positions. The chief accountability officer, the chief fiscal officer of the city of New York, particularly when we have so much revenue coming in from the federal government and we have so much need, now is the time to invest wisely to make sure that every dollar we spend, we can see outcomes. I'm tired of the days where we spend money and no one knows where the money went, so we just spend more. Let's ensure that there's no waste with our dollars. And if there are things we should be doing better, let's highlight that. And that's what a good comptroller can do. I will be transparent. I'll make sure there'll be accountability and that the city of New York, the, the voters of New York can see where all of their tax, do tax dollars are going and they know they have a comptroller on the case to make the, get the job done for, on their behalf. State Senator Brian Benjamin, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us uh, at the 92nd Street Y. Glad to be here. Thank, thank you. you. All right. And next, we have Michelle Caruso Cabrera joining us. And thank you very much for joining us. It's Great to see you. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello. Up? Okay. Do the fist bump. Absolutely. <laughs> Jeff, nice to see you in person. Yes, Hi, James. you too. Fellow TV person. <laughs> well, and look, that's the place to start. Yes. I mean, you're, you're, no, you're, you're best known for your role as a journalist uh, on television and uh, in the financial sector. Yes. Talk about your qualifications. How did those translate to being a sure. qualified comptroller? Yeah, I have a very atypical biography for everybody else who's running for this position, but it's precisely that biography which makes me perfectly suited for this job. So I was an investigative financial journalist. I was at CNBC for 20 years. I started my career at Univision. And what that means is two things. I've covered financial crises all over the world, similar to what's happening here in New York City as a result of the pandemic. And what I've seen over and over again, it doesn't matter what country or city I'm in, those who can least afford to pay always end up paying the most. And we need a recovery in New York City that leaves no one behind. So we can't make the same mistakes that I have seen over and over again. And I have spent decades following the money, asking the hard questions about how it's being spent. And that's what we have to do right now in New York City to make sure that we have a recovery that is equitable, just, inclusive, that brings back jobs, helps small businesses, and you know, keeps people wanting to come to New York and not leave it. Right, but, but and as a fellow sure. television journalist, yeah. uh, there is a difference though, right, between investigative journalism and running a department of 800 people with a very large budget that oversees all kinds of assessments, et cetera. Can you make that? Sure, absolutely, or? yes. Great follow-up question. Income statements, balance sheets, cash flows. I have looked at them for decades. I was on the board of a financial institution, I was on the audit committee, and as the president of the board of the Ballet Hispanico, I have been dealing with those financial statements uh, for an organization right here in New York City. Um, so those are income statements, balance sheets, and cash flows. Those are what you need when you're doing audits of the city's agencies, and also what you need to look at when you're considering investments for the New York City pension funds. These, these are important instruments that provide transparency when you know how to read them. Things stand out in bold that you understand instantly. They are tools and in the right hands, they can be weapons. And too often this position is held by someone who doesn't want to use those instruments. What they really want to do is run for mayor. They want to use this position as a soft launch for a mayoral campaign. There are two people in the race who've dropped down from the mayor's race, so we know why they're in this race. I want to actually do the job. I know how to do the job, and the job is rarely held by someone who really wants to use the power of the audit for good for New York City. Well, in the past couple of years, you have shifted from journalism to politics, yep. of course. Last year, you ran uh, in the Democratic primary against uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Yes. At the time, you really decried her, her socialist politics, and the current controller, uh, Scott Stringer, though not a socialist, has certainly aligned himself with uh, maybe the left, or left wing of the party. And in fact, Ocasio-Cortez herself has endorsed one of your opponents, 
Brad Lander. Uh, wondering if you think that, that Stringer, you know, being a, a self-identified progressive, has let politics, uh, those politics, seep into the office, whether that's affected uh, how he has been controller, and, and if so, what would you change? So first, let me say, I ran that race because I love New York City, and I was very distressed by what I saw happen with Amazon. To this day, I think it's a terrible thing that Amazon did not come to the neighborhood near where I live in Queens. We really could have used those jobs during the pandemic, the construction jobs that would have happened. Um, so that's why I ran that race, not because I wanted to be a politician, but because I love New York City, and that's why I'm running this race as well. Um, let me reiterate, I think the position is too often held by someone who actually really wants to be the mayor. Scott Stringer wanted to be the mayor, so there are times, I think, where he could have been more vocal. At the same time, I think he's done uh, a good job, for example, during the pandemic. The office didn't skip a beat when it came to releasing all the data that we need to know about the state of New York City's finances. Um, but there are times he could have been more vocal, I think, and been a, a greater champion for the right thing to do. Um, but that being said, I think his intentions are actually quite good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, I mean, look, you're talking about somebody that maybe wanted to be mayor first. I mean, didn't you want to be a member of Congress first? You know, is the, are you committed to being controller here? Is this a stepping Abs stone to another job? No, I was the first person in this race to say, I don't want to be the mayor. I want to be the controller. And let me be clear, I did not get in this because I wanted to be a politician. I am in this because I love New York City and I was distressed by what happened last time, and then in the middle of that race, COVID happens, and you can see what's happening to the city. And what really struck me was, you know, the budget under Bill de Blasio, under Corey Johnson, under Brad Lander, it's gone up by $20 billion, from $72 billion to $92 billion a year. I ask everyone who's watching this, does the city feel $20 billion a year better to you? Even before COVID, where did that money go? The controller is the top financial watchdog, and we need someone who can actually pour over the books, who's spent decades investigating how money is being spent and asking hard questions about it. That's the skill set that I bring to the job. Next year's budget is $98 billion. We have to do a really good job of overseeing that money that's coming from the federal government that's going to help us out for the next couple of years as we get through this. You talk about the condition of the city. Uh, and certainly arts and culture is a key part of this city uh, and its condition. I mean, it's been shut down, as we know. Mm -hmm. What can a comptroller, what can you as a comptroller do for the arts and culture sector to ensure it's revitalized and stays vital beyond the pandemic? Yeah, so I, I am a deep lover of culture and arts, uh, and it's one of the things that makes New York City so wonderful. As I mentioned, I'm the president of the board of the Ballet Hispanico. I've been on that board for more than 15 years. Uh, we've got an international, allow me for the little commercial here. We have an international dance troupe. Uh, we teach hundreds of uh, students every year. We give out piles and piles of scholarships to make sure the most needy and uh, have the right, the opportunity to dance. We are in schools with the help of the city council. We do a lot of programming in schools. Um, so yeah, we have to be a champion to the arts because one, it helps lift people and children up. It's also an economic engine for New York City. I mean, people come to see Broadway. They come to see the opera. They come to see ballet. So you know that you have a champion in the arts in me. I have lived it, um, and I am very excited about it. What can the controller do? Again, it's going back to investigating how the money is being spent. Every single uh, uh, program that's put forth by the next mayor and the next city council, we have to examine, are we getting the outcomes we deserve for the money that is being spent? How can we help agencies uh, to make sure that when we um, give the money that we're actually getting the things that we deserve and what New Yorkers need so that we have a recovery that's equitable, just and inclusive, that brings back jobs, that brings back investment, and that helps small businesses. This is the first year of ranked choice voting mm -hmm. in New York City. Uh, what do you think of the process here? I know that some have raised concerns, uh, particularly those that represent uh, black or Hispanic communities, that it might leave some people out or disadvantage some communities. Uh, you know, are you supportive of the process? What have you done to uh, promote it among your voters? And also, uh, 
who else do you trust uh, to be controller? You know, are you ranking any of your, uh, your candidates on the ballot? Uh, you know, I, I am concerned that there hasn't been enough uh, education about the process. I'm very worried about voter disenfranchisement. If somebody decides they want to rank the same person over and over again, um, that their ballot will get thrown out. I think that's really problematic. Um, that being said, I encourage people to use the system because it helps, you know, eliminate having someone win with a small pl plurality, that we get some consensus. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm still in this process. I would really like to see actual more debates. You know, our debates in this process are very, very late com compared to the mayor's race. So I have called for more debates earlier and more frequently. So that way I can really hear my opponents and maybe decide um, who would be my number two or my number three through the list. So, so you two have not decided uh, yet. You, you, need to, you need to hear more from Well, I know who my number one is. I'm the first name on the ballot. Right there. <laughs> Good answer. Yep. Um, and look, no one knows better about countdown clocks yep. than a journalist. Yep. You got a minute to uh, give a closing statement. We're, we're all ears. Well, well, thanks to you for both doing this. You're doing a great job. I've been in that seat, so I know what it's like. Uh. Um, and t thanks to the 92nd Street Y. Uh, what I'd like people to know, one of the things that hasn't come up is I am the only Latina in the race. I'm the only Spanish speaker in the race. Hola a todo el mundo que está mirando en este momento. Um, hello to everyone who's watching right now. Um, you know, there's never been a Latina or a Latino person to hold one of the top three offices in New York City. Mayor, public advocate, or controller's never been held by a Latina or a Latino, even though we represent nearly one third of the population. I think it's high time that we have a change in that we need a, a city government that is reflective um, of the population of New York City. Uh, so I want to be that voice and on top of it all, I have the relevant experience, I have the skill set, and also the independence. I am not a long-term political person who owes lots of favor, favors. I have 30 years of real experience doing real things, not decades of political favors that I owe to other people. And I would love to have your vote. Well. Michelle Caruso Guevara, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate uh, finally getting to meet all the candidates in person. Yes, it's today. great. Jeff and Pleasure. James, thank you. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter and all those things, please. Okay, and next up we have Zachary Iskell. We'd like to welcome him uh, to the stage. How are you guys doing? Good to all see right. you. What are we doing? Nice fist bumps, handshakes? We've been doing fist down. bumps. All may as well make it consistent. Keep on going, exactly. Good to see you. Yeah. Thanks for joining thank us. so much for having me here today. Fist bumps around. It's good to, uh, good to see you in person, Zach. You uh, too. A lot of Zooms. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, look, we're asking uh, candidates about their, their qualifications today. You have a different background than, than many candidates we've seen. You, uh, yeah. of course, served in the military. You have run your own nonprofit, a media company as well. Uh, tell us how that background has, yeah. has prepared you, and you also fill me in on more background. How has yeah. that prepared you uh, for, your, uh, for running for office here as controller? Yeah. First off, thank you for having me here today. Uh, it's great to be with you both. This is such an uh, important part of the race. It's just educating voters, giving voters an opportunity to meet us. It's also great to be here at the 92nd Street Y. This is hallowed ground. I first saw Ellie Wiesel speak here and have always wanted to speak here ever since. So uh, this does feel like hallowed ground. It's great to be here. Uh, so this is my first time running for office, uh, but I've been a public servant now for two decades. My public service started in the Marine Corps. I led troops during some of the heaviest combat of the Iraq War. Uh, I've built businesses, nonprofits, uh, and I'm very, very proud that I've never left anyone behind, in combat or out of combat. When I came home and we abandoned our translators, um, I testified before the United States Senate, fought to bring them over here, helped establish a special immigrant visa that's now helped almost 100,000 Iraqi and Afghans and their families immigrate to the United States. Um, in 2011, when I began to lose more of my Marines to suicide than I did in combat, I built, uh, founded an organization called the Headstrong Project here in New York City in partnership with Cornell Medical Center. We're now in 30 cities, taking care of 800 to 1,000 veterans every single week. And I'm very proud we've not lost a single veteran to suicide uh, in nine years. We've lost one, sadly, to a drug overdose. Um, and at the height of COVID last year, I went to Javits Medical Center as a volunteer. Uh, a few days later, stepped in as the deputy director leading 28 federal, state, and city agencies, helped lead the turnaround of Javits Medical Center into one of the only successful COVID field hospitals in the country. I'm incredibly proud of the team there. They have now vaccinated hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers. The work that they're doing is simply remarkable. But through my career, I have never left anyone behind. And I am concerned that a city that is spending now, the mayor's executive budget that he released a couple weeks ago, $98 billion, more than 48 out of 50 states, almost as much as the next 15 or 20 largest US cities combined, is leaving far too many New Yorkers behind. We do not have the best schools. 
We're seeing increases in crime, in homelessness, uh, public transportation. You name the issue, we should be leading the way, and we're not, and that's because we do not have a culture of accountability, and we're leaving far too many New Yorkers behind. If I may ask quickly, I mean, you, you talk about these criticisms of city government. Uh, you know, before this, I don't think you've had much, if any, interaction with city government, state out of city politics, that sort of thing. You know, what inspired you now in, in 2021 to, to jump in at, at such a high level? Yeah. So part of it was my experience at Javits. You know, I walked into an environment that I was very familiar with, right? 28 federal, state, and city agencies, uh, some of the best people I have worked with in my career. Uh, and yet, unfortunately, there was a lot of struggles to get the agencies to work well together. And a lot of that had to do with the politics outside the building, between the mayor, between the governor, between the president, between the DOD. And the hardest part about what we did there was not building a COVID hospital in five days. We had amazing, amazing engineers that were helping us do that. It wasn't treating COVID patients. We had some of the best doctors and nurses in the world. One, one of the nurses was a army nurse who actually treated some of my guys in Fallujah in 2004. Um, the hardest part was dealing with the politics outside the building. And it became very, very clear to me that we need politicians who care about outcomes, who want to see the best for New Yorkers more than the political outcome. That there were politicians outside the building who had more to gain from our failure because they had something to blame each other for than sharing in our success and actually helping New Yorkers. And that more than anything led me to decide to throw my hat in the ring. Now you've founded a variety of businesses yep. uh, and are involved in a, a variety of projects. One of which is Task and Purpose. Yeah. Founder, CEO, an online publication about military issues yeah. for people who don't know. Your managing editor resigned three years ago. Can we talk about that? He alleged you wanted to change some content in the publication that had threatened editorial independence. Respond to allegations of heavy handedness against you and can you square that with the level-headedness that a position like the comptroller requires? Yeah. Uh, so the allegations were that there was a headline that I wanted to, that I asked about changing. The headline was never changed. Uh, more importantly, the issue that we had was we had an editor who wanted to focus our website specifically on doing a lot of Trump-related content. I have a lot of issues with Trump. I have stood up against Trump. I fought against Trump when uh, he... Uh, said some really horrible things about the Khan family who lost a son uh, overseas, organized a letter of um, some of the leading combat veterans in the United States, some of the most highly decorated special operations veterans, uh, condemning him and demanding an apology. Uh, but for the case of Task and Purpose, we're a military publication. There's a lot of issues that we need to be covering that are of importance to the military community. Things related to Gold Star families, to benefits, to aviation safety things that we have an obligation to cover beyond just spending our time covering Trump. And that was the difference. Um, and as comptroller, you know, we've got to make sure that we're taking care of the entire city, not just focused on any one specific issue. And do you feel that being an entrepreneur really mm -hmm. fits into, how does that fit into the role of comptroller? Yeah, I love that question. So look, I've worked in government. I've worked in the military, I've worked in business, and I've worked in nonprofits. When we think about the comptroller's role in particular, uh, we often forget that it is a management position. It's an executive function. Um, you are responsible for 800 people. I think I'm the only one in the race that has managed a team of that size. In fact, I've managed teams that are larger. Um, and I've done that in nonprofit and in business. I've done it in government. I've done it in the military. I've done it in experiences where you're working 24 hours a day where life and death decisions are being made. And in particular, uh, where outcomes really matter. And I've also had to, in the work I've done, uh, um, measure outcomes. And I think one of the things that's missing from our city government is the accountability of knowing how we are spending dollars and tying them specifically to outcomes to know that we're getting our investments worth. You know, you take homelessness, for example. We spend $3.2 billion a year on homelessness. It's more than almost every major U.S. city combined. But that money is being spent on a shelter system that is actually not helping people escape homelessness. It's not being spent on helping people get out of homelessness. The nonprofit I run, 85 cents of every dollar goes to care. We spent a lot of time and energy developing 11 measurements that are specifically tied to dollars so that we know every veteran we're caring for costs about $5,000 for six months. We can cure PTSD in about six months. We just found out that Thrive NYC, there's a great report in the city recently, $1.1 million per visit at Thrive NYC centers. Nobody is doing the, the analysis and making sure that we're getting our dollars worth. So I think my broad background in government, 
in business, in nonprofits, in the military, in caring for others, in making sure we're not leaving anyone behind, I think it's the perfect fit for the Comptroller's Office. As we shift to arts and culture has been yeah. so devastated by the pandemic. Uh, I believe your wife works in fashion. You know, there's another industry mm -hmm. that uh, hasn't been able to have shows in the yeah. way that it, it used to. Uh, wondering what the controller's role is in, in revitalizing the sector, bringing it back uh, after yeah. this pandemic. So first off, I love this question. Uh, you know, people ask me all the time, what does it take to bring New York City back? Like, what's it going to take? And I think it's fairly simple. I think it's three things. Number one, the city needs to be safe. Right? People need to feel safe from COVID, from crime, from the police, you name it. If people don't feel safe, they are not going to go back to the office. They're not going to stay in the city. Public safety is critically important. Number two, we've got to get kids back in school, and we've got to get people back to work. Parents are not going to stay in, in the city if we do not know that they're going to be caught up, if the schools are not world class. I know there was an announcement yesterday. There's still a lot of work to actually make sure that that is implemented um, properly. Uh, and we've got to get people back to the office. Uh, that's critically important. The third piece is the city can't be boring. Uh, we need our art, our culture, our Broadway, our restaurants, our small businesses. We need to get that to return. Um, and how do you do that? We've proposed in, the comp as, uh, in our race establishing a public bank uh, to make investments that are of the public benefit. We know that an investment in an art and cultural institution uh, in a neighborhood is one of the best economic investments we can make. There are decades of economic data that shows us that a art and cultural institution in a neighborhood irrigates a small garden of small businesses and restaurants just by the foot traffic alone. So we can make investments in art and culture. Um, on top of that, we've proposed a five borough investment strategy. Tom DiNapoli, the state comptroller, has a state pension fund, uh, fund that invests directly in New York City, created tens of thousands of jobs, invested in hundreds of businesses, delivered a 10% IRR to the, city, uh, to the state. We can do that here. And one of those investments can be in art and culture and Broadway uh, and things that, that are part of the fabric of New York City. And the format is, you're familiar with it. You get the last minute. <laughs> you're, you get the last minute to make a closing statement. We yeah. welcome it. So this is what I'd say. Um, you know, this is one of the most consequential elections in the history of New York City. New mayor, new comptroller, 37 out of 51 new city council members. It is incredibly, incredibly important. And we have an opportunity right now on June 22nd, early voting June 12th, to get this right. And I think one of the things that we've really suffered from over the last couple of years is poor leadership. New York City is now spending almost 30 billion more than it was when de Blasio first took office, at least with the new executive budget. This is an astronomical amount of money. And we need leaders who are gonna make sure those dollars are spent in an effective way. $30 billion, the leadership that we have in the city council and the mayor could have given us free public transportation. They could have given us better schools. They could have given us, uh, made city colleges free. They could have gotten universal broadband access uh, um, done. They could have created innovative ways of collecting our trash. There is so much that for $30 billion, three times the budget of LA County alone that we could have done. And to do that going forward in the future is gonna require new leadership. And I think I've demonstrated over my two decades of public service that I am that type of leader. And with that, Zachary Iskell, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us on stage today. Lovely Appreciate to be it. with you both. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. And with that, we will welcome up uh, New York City Council Speaker, Corey Johnson. Step on up to the stage, please. Good to see you again. Hi, good to see Hello. you. Are we shaking hands? We've been we fist bumping. Oh, okay. oh, oh, he's, oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> I don't mind switching it up. Okay. Well, Corey, thank you for joining us today. Of course. Uh, look, New York City controllers have had a variety of backgrounds. Some have worked in finance and banking in the past. Others haven't. Uh, your background is mostly in politics. Uh, tell us you know, how your background here will prepare you to be the next controller and also why a lack of experience uh, in financial management banking uh, isn't a problem. Well, first of all, thank you for having this forum. It's good to see you both. It's nice to be in person after you know, 15 months of not being in person. You know, my uh, my path to government, my path to politics has been an unconventional one. Uh, I moved to New York City at 19 years old with two bags and not much to my name. I grew up in public housing with a mom who worked uh, three jobs. And uh, I got involved because I wanted to change the world. It was hokey and corny, but I thought it could make a difference. And over the last seven and a half years in the council, in the last three and a half years as speaker, uh, I have worked on budgets rivaling $90 billion. 
As Speaker, we created the first subcommittee on the capital budget, an important part of the city's budget that the council hadn't focused on before. We created the oversight and investigations division in the council. The Comptroller's Office does that work. And so I may not have a traditional background as it relates to the Comptroller's Office, but the work that I've done doing oversight, the work that I've done negotiating budgets, the work that I've done taking on big, bold solutions to problems that have uh, been around New York City for a long time, I think shows that I have the requisite experience and vision for this office coming into this recovery and out of this pandemic. You mentioned the capital budget, so I guess I'll get a little bit specific here. Uh, I know that uh, one of the mayoral candidates, Maya Wiley, has proposed uh, really expanding the capital budget. I think boosting it by $10 billion or so as a way to kind of revitalize the city get some money there. It would, of course, require some extra borrowing, which I know last year you went uh, back and forth on whether you thought that the city should uh, should be borrowing more money, knowing that we'll, of course, have to pay it back with interest. Uh, what's your plan for the future? Are you interested in, in that idea, possibly boosting the capital budget, uh, borrowing more for the city, or you prefer to keep it, uh, I guess, on the same path we've been on? Borrowing for capital is fine. We do that on a regular basis, and so I don't know the specifics of Maya's plan. I haven't studied it, but I, it, but it's not irresponsible to borrow on capital dollars. We do that. It's a fine thing to do. It's not looked at as being financially irresponsible. But the mayor's plan last year was to, was to borrow for operating dollars. And I think his initial ask was around $7 billion, asking for borrowing authority from Albany. And doing something like that could get us into the problems we got into in the 1970s. And so I initially opposed sort of that large ask of $7 billion. But when it got trimmed down, when there were parameters in place, when help wasn't coming from the federal government or from Albany, I said we should have that opportunity so we don't have to massively cut services and do layoffs during the height of a pandemic. Uh, ultimately, we didn't need it. Uh, we got through without it. We're getting uh, $5.9 billion in unrestricted federal aid from the American Rescue Plan. And there's more money for education, K through 12, higher ed, vaccinations, FEMA reimbursement, and other pots of money that we're going to get. So we're going to be okay. We're going to manage that in the out years. One of the things we're going to focus on the council and the budget, this upcoming budget next month, is to make sure we don't spend all that money at once. There are 4 to $5 billion gaps on the horizon for fiscal years 2023. 2024 and 2025. The council needs to be mindful of that, and the next controller is going to have to be mindful of that uh, in looking at the city's future in the long term. Now, you're one of two candidates uh, who had been running for mayor, yes, uh, but is now seeking this position, along with your predecessor in that chair, yep. Zach, uh, Zach Iskell. Um, in that case, you cited mental health challenges as the reason for stepping out of the mayor's race. How this is a citywide office, much like the mayor's uh, position. Um, how are you prepared for this citywide job when you said you weren't for the mayor's office? I really believe everything happens for a reason. In my life, coming out at 16 years old in a small town, moving to New York City at 19, finding out I was HIV positive at 22, struggling with drugs and alcohol and getting sober at 27, I believe everything that's happened really happens for a reason. And last fall, when I publicly disclosed that I had been struggling for some months during the height of the pandemic, uh, I made the right decision for myself. I took the time. I got the help that I needed. I've always tried to be open and honest and destigmatize things that most elected officials are afraid to talk about. But I feel great. I feel excited about New York City's future. I feel like we're going to have the roaring 20s if we have the right leadership. And I feel up for the job. Uh, I have been energized the last many months being out on the campaign trail, talking to New Yorkers, putting my vision forward for the office. And people should judge me on what I've done in the council, my ideas, uh, the legislation that we've passed, the work that I've done as a member, the work that I've done as a speaker. I think I want people to look at the totality of my time in office and what brought me to public office uh, to start with. And someone else who was in that chair earlier, Michelle, uh, Michelle Caruso Cabrera, pointed out something I think a lot of people feel, that people who uh, try to be in the comptroller's seat use it to ultimately become mayor. Could, is that still in the cards for you? And if it is, how 
strongly can you say your commitment to this position? I'm fully committed to being controller. If I wanted to be running for mayor right now, I would be running for mayor. But I made the decision last fall to take some time for myself. And once I got the help that I needed, uh, and I got some encouragement from colleagues in the council and other people in government to look at this job, and I think it's the right job for me. So I have no idea, I'm not gonna be cute about it, I have no idea what's gonna happen eight years from now. If I win, hopefully I'll be reelected to the position. I would run for reelection, uh, but you know none of us can can predict the future. And I'm not going to make you know promises here today, uh, just to you know to do it because it may sound right. That's not the type of person I've ever been. Uh, I can't predict what the future holds. I never thought that when I moved here at 19 years old and I knew one person and did not have much money that I would ever be in the city council or be speaker of the city council. So you have to take life a day at a time. That's what I've done in my recovery and sobriety. I stay sober a day at a time. I can't project what's gonna happen four years, eight years. I don't know what's gonna happen next week. Uh, so I can't make promises today on the stage, but I can tell you that I'm excited about this job. I'm excited about New York City's future. And I think the next controller is gonna have a lot of work to do to make sure this recovery is done right. So I'd like to ask you to look a little bit into the future. Sure. Project. Okay. Uh, anybody who's heard you speak knows that you have a real zeal for uh, the arts and culture of New York, what, what makes it. And you've also represented uh, much of the theater district and the city council for the past eight years. Uh, what's the role of the controller in revitalizing that sector as we come out of the coronavirus pandemic? And, and what would you do? Well, th there's, a, there's a lot that we can do. And number one, I know I heard Zach talk about it and I agree with him. You have to focus on making sure people feel safe coming to New York City. You need to make sure that small businesses and restaurants that are part of the ecosystem of the theater district, of arts and culture around New York City can uh, thrive and reopen and get the support that they need. But you also, as controller, you don't have the direct role in allocating money, but you do have a direct role in coming forward with reports and with plans and with analysis about how important the sector is for our economy. Before the pandemic hit, the number of people that came to Broadway shows every single year was more than what came to every single sports team over the course of a season for each sports team combined. So Broadway is an economic engine, but it's not just Broadway, it's off-Broadway theaters, it is Broadway theaters, it is museums, not just in Manhattan, but in the outer boroughs. And so we need to make sure that all of them get the support they need. We're gonna do that in this upcoming budget. We're gonna focus on making sure that in the budget that we adopt next month is focused on arts and culture and ensuring they get the help that they need coming out of this pandemic. I feel very hopeful. I saw that Hades Town is opening up on September 2nd. I hope to be there that opening night. Mm -hmm. I do want to ask you very quickly sure. also, your city council, you've been very uh, a big supporter of ranked choice voting uh, and in fact have you know, helped pass it. In fact, uh, any idea who you're going to be ranking on your ballot? I don't know yet. I, I think the field is actually a very uh, great field. I think uh, everyone who's running has brought a lot to the race. Uh, I've really been focused on you know, my own campaign and getting out there across the city, but uh, I think each one of the candidates brings a unique set of skills and ideas, uh, and, uh, and I'm really grateful we can have this conversation. All right, uh, yet another person not committing but we appreciate the answer. Uh, please, your, your closing statement. I love the city. And it's not just about the love of the city that's gonna bring it back. It's going to be coming up with big, bold plans and ideas. I put forward a policy agenda uh, just a couple of months ago, talking about what the controller's office can do. And we have to make sure that these are not just sort of numbers on a page. When we're thinking about our recovery, it needs to be about people. We have a record amount of homelessness, we have affordable housing that is not really affordable. Uh, we have uh, 600,000 jobs that have been lost. We need to think about the people that have been impacted by this pandemic, and they need to be centered in our recovery. My mom taught me a motto at a very early age, which was do the most good for the people who need it the most, and that's my North Star every single day. New York City Council Speaker Corey Johnson, thank you so much for Thanks, joining Jeff. us Great on to stage see you today. Again. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. And joining us next, Council Member Brad Lander, Appreciate your being with us. So good to be here. Your Thank fist bump. you. Great to see you both. <laughs> uh, a council member from Brooklyn um, and proud. For sure. I'm, I'm, it's nice to be at the 92nd Street Y, but uh, Brooklyn is pretty great. So talk with us about 
how your qualifications, your background, qualify you for this position. Yeah. Thank you guys for doing this. It really is nice to be here at the 92nd Street Y. Uh, I'm Brad Lander. I'm running for controller to secure a just recovery for New York City. I spent 25 years fighting for New Yorkers, for tenants, for workers, for sustainable neighborhoods. For 15 years, I ran two great nonprofit organizations um, that help neighborhoods come back from abandonment, from that abandonment crisis, turning shuttered storefronts into vibrant small businesses and genuinely affordable housing. Then for the last decade, I've been in the city council where laws that I've sponsored have raised pay for fast food workers, protected freelancers, Uber and Lyft drivers, helped bring uh, combat school segregation in our public schools, and bring participatory budgeting to New York City. Um, I know my way around the city's budget inside and out. I've been one of the big champions on strengthening the capital budget and getting better capital projects management. And I've passed legislation to make government work better in all kinds of ways, ban outside income, and Lulu's get good government. So what I know how to do is see big, bold, progressive goals for workers, for tenants, for our neighborhoods, and then hold government accountable to get it done. A variety of critics have said, uh, and not even critics. I mean, it's, it's, it's been in a variety of publications. You're the most liberal, the most progressive member of the city council. So can you square that with, the, with what you're saying about the big picture as it pertains to serving all New Yorkers. Not Absolutely. everyone's progressive. So look, I'm a proud progressive. I'm proud to have the support of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Jumani Williams and Jerry Nadler and State Senator Liz Kruger right here and Senator Elizabeth Warren. I want government to do big, bold things, to protect small businesses, to keep people from getting evicted from their homes, to demand pay equity for women and people of color, uh, to expand childcare. But for government to deliver on any of those promises, it has to work better. That's what I've done in the council, and that's what I'll do every day as controller, as budget watchdog, as chief accountability officer, dig in on agencies and tell the truth, because government can't deliver on any promises when people don't believe what you're saying, when there's no accountability for mismanagement or corruption, when projects cost too much or take too long. So it is resolutely progressive to demand that government work better, and I believe very deeply in it. That's exactly why I'm running for this job. Speaking of these progressive politics, you were one of the city council members to vote against the budget last year, uh, primarily because the uh, NYPD was not adequately defunded. Uh, however, you've also been, uh, well, it's been noted that you also directed some money towards the Shamrim Security Patrol in, in your district, uh, which is a, uh, you know, essentially an, an outside police force. Uh, wondering if that's an inconsistency here with your calls to defund the police or, or whether that fits in. So first, I haven't funded them in six years, and they're not an outside police force. They don't have guns or badges. So that's just kind of a silly attack from some people that I guess maybe don't want me to win. But look, all communities want to be safe in every single neighborhood, and we can achieve that. You know, I mentioned I got here 25 years ago, and I rolled up my sleeves in community development because investments in affordable housing, investments in good jobs, investments in our young people. We started a program helping people come back from prison and jail that gave them good opportunities and made the neighborhood safer. So what I believe, whether it's responding to folks who are in mental distress or so, uh, folks who are homeless or kids in our schools, those kids need guidance counselors and not cops in their schools. So what we didn't do in last year's budget was fund those guidance counselors, was fund summer youth jobs, was fund housing so homeless people could get off the streets, was fund better mental health supports. That's how we keep all communities safe. That's exactly what I've been doing before I was in the council, in the council working with Jumani Williams on the Community Safety Act to hold the NYPD accountable. And that's how I'll approach the NYPD and the controller's office. What keeps communities safe by investing in our neighborhoods? Speaking on that, I mean, is there something that com the controller can do about uh, criminal justice reform, policing reform beyond just using your bully pulpit? Absolutely. So in each of those areas I mentioned, in thinking about how we keep our schools safe and support our kids, or responding to folks who are in mental distress, there's great examples around the country of how to do that in ways that don't lead with a gun and a badge. You know, right now, most mental health calls are responded to when you call 911, a cop comes. I met this amazing woman, Hawa Ba. Her son, Mohammed, was having a mental health crisis. She called 911. She said, please don't send police. Uh, send an ambulance. He needs help. But we sent police. The NYPD came. They broke down her door. She begged them not to come in and killed Mohammed. 
if we had sent mental health, trained mental health emergency workers and counselors, he'd be alive today. So what the controller can do is an audit that says, look, here's a program that's working. That can be true for violence interruption, for guidance counselors in our schools, for approaches to traffic safety or for mental health distress. And you do an audit that says, what are we spending and what are we getting and what do people want? So yes, that's what it means to audit for equity, to audit for safety. Yes, looking at the budget, every dollar, how we spend it, but paying attention to the outcomes our neighborhoods want and need. You talked about the 92nd Street Y, what an honor it is to Love be the here and their Street mission. Uh, and that mission includes arts and culture. Absolutely. Um, what role do you see the comptroller playing in the revitalization of the arts and culture section? And what role do you see you specifically mm. doing based on your background? Absolutely, I'm proud to be the arts and culture candidate in this race. I'm supported by the League of Independent Theaters, by the Musicians Union, Local 802, and by the Freelancers Union. With the Freelancers Union, I passed a great bill called the Freelancers and Free Act that protects freelancers from wage theft because 70% of our musicians and artists and freelancers have gotten stiffed out of money that they were earned. We've become the first city in the country, thanks to my law, to change that. So we are a place where creative people want to come and be and perform. Last Saturday night, the Brooklyn Conservatory of Music had an amazing 20 stoops full of music in our neighborhood, and I can't tell you how good it felt. One thing I want to fight for in the council now and then audit and make sure works as controller is commercial rent stabilization because our arts businesses and our small creative businesses are getting pushed out by rising rents. So that's one economic policy we can have that makes sure we have a vibrant arts recovery. Mm -hmm. Um, but but if you can briefly just talk about it on a much larger scale, like a citywide scale. Well, commercial rent stabilization is a citywide policy. First of all, the Freelances and Free Act is a citywide policy that's protecting artists in all five boroughs. Commercial rent stabilization would say for for small businesses, including arts businesses and nonprofits. My neighbor's got an amazing dance studio, but these are from East New York up to you know to Baychester. We've got community-based arts organizations. We must bring Broadway back, and I'm glad that they're going to be reopening. But arts are in all our neighborhoods, but so many of the arts groups get pushed out because they can't afford a place to be. We've got a chance right now with com vacant commercial properties in a lot of neighborhoods to help our artists and our small businesses and those arts nonprofits open up and be there stably. And that's what will bring people back to our city, create good jobs, and make our neighborhoods thrive vibrantly. That's why you can do an economic analysis from the controller's office and say, let's look at what it's costing us. It makes sense to have that program because of what it'll bring us in the long term. This is the first year of ranked choice voting, as you know. Uh, I know you've been a big supporter. Some more moderate politicians have raised concerns, including some of your colleagues in the city council, that this might have a disparate impact, uh, particularly in black and, black and brown communities. Wondering uh, what your response to that is. Do you think that this will be, uh, you know, have a, an even impact, I guess, across the city, RCV? All the evidence from every city it's been put in place in shows that more people of color and more women get elected after ranked choice voting is in place. I think that'll happen here. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, uh, who do you intend to rank on your ballot uh, for controller? So first is Brad Lander. Please put me number one. I've been very impressed with Reshma Patel, who I know you're going to hear in a few minutes. Um, I not only know her from some of her work in Eastside Democratic politics, but from her work with the Chaya CDC. That's a community development group that I first met when I was chair of the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development. We work together on legalizing basement apartments, protecting small homeowners, fighting for tenants in uh, South Asian communities and more broadly throughout the city. So Reshma has my number two. Honestly, I just want to thank you for giving us a name. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You're the first. That's so hard. <laughs> You're the first one. <laughs> and, and with that, we have about a minute left. I want to give you an opportunity to make a closing statement to our Absolutely. audience. Absolutely. So one way to think about the controller's office is as the city's long-term risk officer. You're looking downstream. So much of our politics is short-sighted. Just the next news cycle, you know, the next tweet, whatever it is. But we need somebody who's thinking about the long term. That's guaranteeing retirement security for our public sector workers, making sure our public finance, our municipal bonds, are strong and sound, 
but also thinking what are the risks we face. We didn't see the COVID crisis coming and we're paying the price in the lives of over 30,000 of our neighbors. But we could all see the climate crisis coming and we could be doing the work to get ready for it, to really make sure our coastal resiliency projects are happening. I've got a plan for 25,000 rooftop solar installations to convert to green energy and create good green jobs. I'm gonna do a study that looks at what are the biggest risks we're facing in health, in climate, in finance, and say, how do we get more ready for them than we were for this one? That is a progressive policy. That's why I'm so proud to be supported by AOC and Jumani Williams and Elizabeth Warren. And I hope you'll join me in voting for them on June 22nd. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Thank you. Great to be here. Councilmember Brad Lander, thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, next up, we'd like to welcome Terry Lifton to the stage. Good to see you. Hi, James. <laughs> nice uh, to see you. Oh. We've been fist bumping. Okay. Um, nice to oh, right. yeah, sure. yeah, finally. <laughs> One of those things. Nice to meet you. <sighs> and look, Terry, a lot of your uh, competitors for this seat have had uh, have been in the public eye. They're either journalists or public officials. You have had the maybe the good luck of not being in the public eye. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and right. how it has prepared you for running for controller? That's my favorite question. Uh, so I grew up on Long Island, right on the Queens, Nassau County border. Both my parents were college professors. They're living on their pensions right now. I moved to Manhattan in 1986 to attend Barnard College, graduate in 1990. I have a master's degree in economics from NYU. And after that, I worked at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. I was actually working in the Twin Towers the first time uh, the attempt was made to take them down. And then I went to Brooklyn Law School on a scholarship. So after Brooklyn Law School, I worked in two large law firms. The first is where I learned the anatomy of a legal case. You know, when to fight, when to settle. And then I moved over and I learned the securities laws. Um, and then when my husband and I decided to start a family, I moved in-house to the asset management business. And that's where I've been for 15 years. And I rose up to be the chief legal, chief compliance officer. So what did I do? Well, I was a fiduciary. The firms where I worked managed pension assets, private, state, local, city, Taft-Hartley pension money. As the chief legal officer, I reviewed hundreds of contracts and I reoriented those contracts away from services to paying for performance, paying for success. And as the chief compliance officer, I've put in countless um, forensic monitoring programs to track expenses and make sure they were proper. And well, noting that yes. background, right? You've done a lot clearly with compliance. Uh, which is well in keeping with the description for this job. But this job is also very much in the public eye and your competitors, many of them have been in the public sphere for years and years. Um, what, what do you think you can do that can best connect the residents of this city with the purpose of the job, with the description of the job. I mean, some of the stuff can be a little arcane, a little uh, unexciting, if you will, for some New York City residents. How do you make, as someone who's not been in the public eye for as long as some of your competitors, how do you make it relevant to the people of the city? Okay, well, you know, first, it's, it's very exciting for me. I mean, I've devoted my life to you know, being a fiduciary and working on behalf of others. Um, you know, I believe the controller's office is, is not a political office. It's, it's an office where a professional should reside. And you know, when I talk to voters, I talk about it simply as you know, my job, you know, I, I'm a moderate, I'm a fiscally responsible, but I have a big heart. And you know, my job is to make sure that every tax dollar is spent effectively and efficiently, and it delivers the services to those in need. And I know a, a lot of us talk about the increase in the budget, and there's even more money um, that came from the federal government. You know, every dollar we have is being spent, and people aren't better off. And you know, co bringing competency to bear, not just to follow the money, but to solve problems and to make a difference, that's what I'll do. Mm -hmm. 
And do you feel that, uh, do you feel that you can relate the job you'll be doing effectively to the people who are, who are affected by the job? So the short answer is yes. I've had no problem connecting with voters on the street and talking to them. Yeah, I, and um, you know, people say, well, people don't know what the controller does. People know what the controller does. People have been paying a lot of attention recently, so I have faith in the voters. You know, new, competent experience, they like it. Hmm. And they want it, they crave it, um, because they know we need something different. The arts sector has been devastated by COVID-19 pandemic uh, more than even many other areas of the city. Right. Wondering what role you think the Comptroller's Office would play in revitalizing it, bringing it back? Now look, so, you know, New York is the best city in the world, and a lot of that is because of our arts and our cultural institutions. Um, that's what makes New York best, and it also provides substantial emotional relief to New Yorkers, both adults and children, which is so needed as we emerge from COVID. You know, so first, I, I think we need to use the money in the budget, if I have my numbers right, 170 million um, to the Department of Cultural Affairs. Let's provide grants now, a bridge to performers. They can't wait a year for funding. They need it now. A very small percent of the jobs in the, a percentage of the jobs in the arts has returned. Uh, you know, two, we need to focus on public safety. As long as the New York Times publishes on the front page that New Yorkers are scared, that the fear of crime is on the rise, tourists aren't gonna come. Pre-COVID, tourists made up 65% of Broadway ticket buyers. They're not gonna come if they feel scared. And we need tourists to come because when they come and they buy tickets, they stay in our hotels, they eat in our restaurants, they shop in our stores. So, you know, the cultural institutions are also an important part of our revenue ecosystem here in the, in the city. And boy, our government needs to do its job and then let the artists shine and do what they do best. When you talk about public safety, then, are you talking about just uh, maintaining full funding for the NYPD? You're talking about what other role can the Comptroller's Office play in uh, maintaining public safety in New York? Well, you know, a lot of people, when they talk about um, you know, public safety and, and crime, I would say it, it doesn't do anyone good for our, our mayor you know, t to deny that crime is real. I mean, crime is real and we feel it. I've been on the subway and sometimes it's a great experience, but other times I have to move in between cars and I've been taking the subway for 35 years and I'm a black belt in Taekwondo. I've never been scared before. Sometimes I'm scared now. So the fear is real. The police budget, $5 billion, that's just an operating cost. There's another 5 billion in pension and benefits. So now we're talking $10 billion. You know, are, are we, you know, here's the linear equation for $10 billion, are we, are we getting our dollars worth? No, we're not. Um, so as controller, you speak out on the importance of public safety and then you do an audit. You make sure that, you know, we're not wasting money, that civilians are sitting behind desks, that police are out on patrol, and that communities get back to trusting the police and the burden is on the police to make sure that that happens. And this election, for the first time, we'll have ranked choice yeah. voting, yeah. including for this position. Uh, can you tell us, first of all, what you think of the process of, of ranked choice voting, and then about your own ballot? Who do you intend to rank on your ballot when you vote? Yeah, so I, I remember I jumped into this race, and a lot of smart people told me, you know, ranked choice voting is great for you, Terry. So I believe them. And then I remember the RFPs for the ballot machines just went out in December. And I thought, how the heck is this going to work? You know, there's going to be, we're not going to be ready in June. Um, so I still have my doubts that we're going to be ready. And I read something the other day that results won't come out until July. Um, so that's a problem. But in terms of voters, I actually have faith in voters. I, I think they understand how it's going to work. Um, and, you know, I've been moderately surprised and pleased with the educational efforts. I mean, it's hard to turn on the TV these days without seeing some explanation. You know, every day my household gets five pieces of mail that explains it. A number of us are, 
know, talking about it on different shows. Um, so it, it's certainly an experiment, and government could have done better. But um, you know, let's see how it works out. I hope it works out for the better. And in the little time we have before your oh, summation, yes. just can you say who you might rank as two or three on your own back? I haven't decided. I haven't decided yet. Yeah, you know, I'm still. I'm still encouraging people to vote for Terry Lifton number one, um, but I will. I will have a number two, three, four, and five. There are a lot of good candidates in this race, as others have pointed out. Mm -hmm. And now for your closing. Okay, so now for my closing. So I'll keep it 50 seconds long. Yeah. So I mean, as I mentioned in my opening, I've lived in Manhattan for 34 years, and I've felt the effects, and I've lived through a national recession, a terrorist attack. Hurricane Sandy, the global financial crisis. This time, you know, it feels different. And it's not just COVID. It's because, you know, in the past, New Yorkers were always brought together. And we've always emerged stronger and more diverse in our population and our businesses. But I feel like we've been pulled apart over the last eight years and pitted against one another. And we've spent an enormous amount of money, wasted money, and and, and the people who really need the services haven't gotten them. So, you know, I think the controller is an important piece of the next four years, and we need someone new, competent, who can solve our problems. Terry Lifton, candidate for New York City Controller, thank you so much for thank joining us. Thank you so much it. for having me. Absolutely. And with that, I would like to welcome up uh, Kevin Parker, state senator from Brooklyn. Come up to the stage. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Gentlemen, how are Great you? Great to see you. How's everything going? Appreciate it. Good, good, good. good I've been, I've been watching the video, so I know what you're doing fist bumps. Thank you. Uh, there you go. You studied <laughs> up the on the homework. This. And in fact, you were studying up on, uh, on how to, uh, to greet us. I'd like to learn how you've been studying up to, to be the controller. You, uh, of course, are one of the candidates who's been in politics for a while, state senator for, uh, gosh, I think 15 years or something. Tell us a little bit about that, your background, and... Uh, how you particularly are best uh, prepared to, yeah. to fit this job. I'm gonna tell you a quick story. There was a young woman who was born in New Bern, North Carolina. She got pregnant about 15 years old. As many families do, they sent her north to live with her cousins while she had the baby. She wound up having the baby in Harlem Hospital and giving it up for adoption. That baby was born in December 1932. So bad in 1932 that rats was kicking over garbage cans, eating onions and crying like babies. Young man, black child, grew up in foster care, kicked around until he was able to take a city job with transit. It allowed him to move into a new nature development in Bushwick. He married his high school sweetheart after he had gone to, high, to the boys' high, she went to girls' high. He had five children. His youngest son became a state senator. I grew up in the Bushwick projects. I went to public school my entire life. There's nobody in this race that has the kind of just hometown, regular upbringing that I have. I've spent almost 30 years working in public service, everything from the state assembly to the city council, worked for the first governor Cuomo, worked for H. Carmer, called in the state controller's office, you know, worked on Wall Street for a while at Payne Weber and then helped Hillary Clinton become U.S. Senator before getting elected myself and then spending 18 years in the New York State Senate where I've been on the finance committee, the insurance committee, the banking committee, and the entire time as either the ranking member or the chairman, as I am now, of the Energy and Telecommunications Committee, um, as well as serving as the majority whip for not one, but for three different leaders. And so that's the experience I bring, but it also I bring a sense of leadership, but most importantly, vision for what the city can be and should be. You mentioned Wall Street. Uh, some of your colleagues do have that financial experience, private sector, some mm -hmm. don't. Uh, do you think that that particular experience is, is necessary for a controller, you know, having worked in the markets? Yeah, I think it is important to understand um, how the markets work, how do you place yourself in the markets, um, but also how do you use the markets most importantly to help people, because that's ultimately what this job is about. Now, in two separate cases, you reached plea deals involving physical attacks on people, mm -hmm. including a traffic agent and a New York Post photographer. Well, not plea deals. <laughs> How would you? Well, and in and, and, and the first one, the, the case was, was dropped. In the second one, um, I was found innocent. Um, but the reality is that what you find is that I have a record of fighting for my community. You know, people talk about that. Physically. But people talk about the IDC, right? But I'm the whip. And the reason why I've been the whip on the three leaders is because taking back a, 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 a body, right, that had been, 
you know, essentially a permanent minority. And if, you know, for 70 years, the Democratic Party was in a minority. I'm part of about four or five people who literally flipped this body, not once, but twice. And I did it from leadership. And that's the kind of leadership I'm going to provide right now as, as city controller. This is tough times. And so, you know, you're not going to change the world with a whisper. Right? And so if, you know, I need to stand up to a mayor or stand up to a, a speaker or stand up to the council, people know I have the ability to do that. But I'm also one of the most accomplished members of the state legislature passing over 70 laws, which means I also know how to, how to collaborate with people and how to bring the best out of my colleagues. But let me do it this way. Okay. All right. The New York Times editorial board described you as, quote, known as the man with frightening rages that could erupt at any time and on almost any subject. City and state described you in 2019 as having, quote, a long history of making explosive remarks and getting involved in scuffles. How do you convince voters that you have the, the temperament to be comptroller? Because the voters have voted for me through all, through all of that. And the voters know me, right? The people in the New York Times and, and people at City State, with all due respect, don't work with me every day in the halls of, of the legislature. And they're not in Flatbush, East Flatbush, Midwood, Dittmas Park, Windsor Terrace, or Park Slope, the communities I represent, right? They don't go with me to Vanderbilt Park United Methodist Church. They don't see me at the mosque, right? These folks are not there when the work that we're doing to advance things like, for instance, being with Tish James on Friday when we, you know, introduced a new bill to deal with excessive use of force, as today we uh, unfortunately mark um, a one year of the death of George Floyd is really doing that important work that has really been my hallmark and that's the things that voters really know about me. Mm -hmm. We're here at the 92nd Street Y, mm -hmm. one of the premier arts and cultural institutions in the city, uh, which is of course a sector that's been devastated by the pandemic more than many others. Mm -hmm. Wondering what you think the controller's role is in revitalizing that sector, bringing it back. It's a critical one and when we talk about about it, I, you know, I've heard my other colleagues talk about you know, Broadway, and that's really the problem and the difference between me and everybody else is that I'm really talking about an equitable recovery. The question is not whether, we, that whether the city of New York comes out of, the, out of the pandemic. It's the greatest city in the world. It will, it will revive itself. The question are black, Latino, and Asian communities, or women, or immigrant communities, are they going to have the opposite, opportunity to have an equitable right, recovery? And so I'm saying that what we need to focus on is community-based you know, nonprofits and community-based arts organizations in the outer boroughs, because that's where full-time jobs at a living wage with, be with benefits are coming along. We need to understand those nonprofits, those, those um, community-based organizations as small businesses that have employee bases, right, and, and have their own economies. And I certainly would do two things, one of which is do economic analysis to demonstrate that and figure out what resources that we can send their way. The second thing is I want to create a partnership between, a collaboration really, between the City Controller's Office and, and CUNY to put a small business development center at every single CUNY campus. Why? Because people need access to capital, they need bonding, they need mentorship, and they need technical assistance, even nonprofits. Because again, nonprofits are nothing but small businesses. They just, they're just structured a little bit different from a, a revenue perspective. But, but ultimately, they're, they're small businesses and they need the kind of help um, that we have not been providing to create those jobs. Because we have an economy that's moved from Wall Street to Main Street. And it's really those Main Street businesses are, are gonna be the way out for this city. Mm -hmm. do, do you feel like the current Comptroller's Office has been uh, neglecting the, I guess, the outer boroughs, you might say, or, or you know, neighborhoods outside of the, the business cores? I think the entire city has, has ne neglected the outer boroughs. Um, you know, again, coming from Brooklyn, born and raised you know, in, in Brooklyn, New York, I know that we don't get the same, you know, the same services, the same attention. Um, as Manhattan, for instance, and particularly, you know, a community in which we're, like, we're sitting in now, right? And there's a way for everybody to get served. This is not the Upper East Side or, or Flatbush, right? I think they, there's enough, right? There's enough. And a $92 billion budget, there's enough. And so um, I'm in this race because I really have a sense of equity in what we need to do. One of the ideas I've put forward is creating an economic equity council made up of business leaders and community leaders, labor leaders, right? you know, and clergy leaders to help make decisions. I know I have some of the answers, but not all of them. And we need to work collaboratively. It'll be kind of like the World Economic Forum, except for New York City. And I think that would help us mark a way forward to allow all boats to rise together. A political strategy question for you. Uh, so we have ranked choice voting coming up and some candidates have allied with one another. Like I'll be number one, you be my number two and so forth down the line. For this position, what would your ballot look like? Are, are you thinking of maybe allying with any of the other candidates to try and uh, make the ranked choice voting work best for you and them? 
Well, first of all, let me say this, that, that we have like an amazing, you know, field of candidates. There's some, a, a lot of really good ideas, folks who have, you know, bring various um, skills and experiences to the table. So I'm, I'm very proud and, and I'm frankly humbled to be um, part of this, this group. I'm still thinking it through. I think that it's certainly, a, given ranked choice voting, uh, you, know, I, you know, I think is, you know, something that you should do. Um, it won't be Brad Lander because he already picked Rushma instead of me. I'm heartbroken because he's one of my council members. I told him that already. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. There's enough, can there's enough candidates uh, around. So, uh, you know, we'll figure something out as we get closer to Election Day. And the process itself, though, uh, you, how do you feel about the process itself of ranked choice? You know, I think that in, the, in this particular moment that it really is, is not going to work as well as we think it is. Um, you know, I don't think that we have quite done the education that we need to do. I think most people are not paying enough of attention, even though there has been mailings and videos. In fact, NYC Votes just put out a, a video that I think debuted yesterday on it. Um, it. I don't think we're quite there yet with communities under, understanding it. It also, what we see also from, the, from the, the data from around the country is that it takes a while and most communities still bullet vote. And I expect that that's gonna happen, and particularly in black and Latino communities. And with that, we want to give you an opportunity to uh, make a closing statement to our audience. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just say that, one, thank the, the 92nd Street Y for hosting us and, and having this conversation, um, and really appreciate to have an idea, you know, an opportunity to kind of share my ideas about the city. Um, I think I have the three things that, that the controller needs, right, which is experience, leadership, and vision. Um, and I've talked a little bit about that. I really, again, want to do a lot of work around equity, which I think is the major question in this moment, and develop an ec economic equity you know, council. I want to develop small business centers to make sure that we put full-time jobs at living wage with benefits do small businesses where people work at. I want to audit the police department, not because I want to you know, defund the police, but because I believe that we can have a NYPD that serves and protects, but does it with dignity and respect. I want to not just invest in Wall Street, I want to invest in our schools. Music, art, athletics, and dance is regular parts of the curriculum. Reduce class size, expand school-based athletics, and really make sure that we are, not that we have UPK, to have universal after school, to put resources into after schools, not just for our young people, but also for parents, kind of the Beacon School model that uh, Jeff Canada created that I think would work greatly around the city. And with that, State Senator Kevin Parker, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Thanks so, so much. much. I appreciate the opportunity. Appreciate Absolutely. you. Take thank care. you. And, and next, we have Reshma Patel joining us. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Yes, you're doing the fist bumps, right? <laughs> yes. It's wonderful, nice to, see you. wonderful to meet both of you. You got the memo yes. about the fist bumps. Yeah. Uh, and, and look, you've spent a lot of time uh, in the nonprofit sector. Yes. Um, talk about that background and how it qualifies you for being controller of the city of New York. Well, thank you for recognizing the work with the nonprofit sector because that work has all been as a volunteer. And um, most recently I've served as board co-chair of Chaya Community Development Corporation in Queens, which serves South Asian immigrant communities in Jackson Heights and Richmond Hill area. It serves the Indo-Caribbean community and South Asian communities in those neighborhoods. Um, I've you know, been working with them for about four years as a board member and was a volunteer before that. And the work is really from the ground up and helping new immigrants get a foothold in uh, this country, uh, start off fighting for tenants' rights and fighting abusive landlords, helping people buy their first home, teaching financial literacy to people. And we got 10,000 people out to vote last year. And it really helped me understand different community needs. Because in addition to the South Asian immigrant community that lives in those neighborhoods, there is a large Latino immigrant community, other Asian Americans, you know, really, you know, as New York City is, right? We have immigrants from everywhere. And seeing the needs um, in many ways similar, or many ways different, and understanding the different lived experiences of these communities and understanding their needs. And this past year, we had started a COVID relief fund and there were so many members of the community who didn't qualify for unemployment. We had unemployment almost as high as 80% at one point last April and May. And talking to them, I understood that how their voices had not been heard in our city government. And really one of the reasons why I was prompted to run is because so many people in that community wanted their voices to be heard at a bigger level. And as you know, we know the pandemic took 31,000 lives in the city and a lot of them were in those neighborhoods. And um, I think we need to be doing things better and you know, my nonprofit experience, while it's been great being on the ground doing the work, I think the way to amplify voices is to really run for office and take a bigger stage. 
And when you've done, when you've been involved uh, at the community level, and you you mentioned specifically f financials, that's on a community level, an individual level. Yeah. But really, the comptroller's office does this writ large, right? How do you see your experience applying to this citywide office? Sure. So I, my professional experience has been 20 years working in public finance, where I worked very closely with the deputy control for public finance. I served as financial advisor for eight years, and I helped do critical infrastructure financings um, around the country to help fund schools, bridges, roads, airports. Um, but in particular, um, worked very closely with New York City and uh, became an expert in managing the city's debt, in structuring its bond issues, and in refinancing at times when we had budget shortfalls to create millions of dollars in savings. And I think it's an important part of the city government that gets overlooked. Um, if we think about, you know, a lot of people in the past year have said, oh, New York is, you know, in a bad situation before we got the pandemic relief money from the federal government. And they compare it to the 1970s. And in the 70s and 75, it was the city not being able to pay its bond debt service and not being able to access the capital markets is where we were almost on the verge of bankruptcy. Right. And so it's an important area and people haven't talked about it. So in addition to uplifting the voices of the communities that I live and work in, I also want to uplift that area of our city government that's been overlooked. And it's a critical area, especially if we're going to be in a situation where we have financial crisis. You mentioned your role in public sector finance. We have many of your competitors coming to this uh, this election from very public facing jobs, yes. elected officials, et cetera. Uh, Wondering what kind of role you would take as a controller. Is this a, a, a you know, private job, inward facing, focusing on uh, you know, uh, auditing the books, or would you be taking a, a public facing role, uh, you know, explaining these these uh, larger issues of, of accounting and assessment and oversight to the the New York uh, residents? Yeah, well, I would hope to do both. So I have been a quant. Um, I. I went to MIT, you know, a math and science person, worked as the quant person when I, in my years in finance and doing all the number crunching. But at the same time, I was also public facing, talking to clients. And then in my personal life and my volunteer work, you know, I serve on a community board, Manhattan Community Board 6. I'm vice chair of the budget committee on that, as well as the Environment and Parks Committee. And I've done a lot of other work teaching financial literacy to young people, um, being a member of the League of, League of Women Voters, doing civics education work. So I've had a lot of outward facing roles and I've had to work with a lot of elected officials in New York City. I'm also president of a democratic club, the Eleanor Roosevelt Democratic Club. So I've been involved in politics. I know a lot of our elected officials and I have been outward facing and especially with the work with the League of Women Voters, where I'm explaining to people in different community groups, explaining to students what our city government does, why it's important to vote, and I want to take that to the Comptroller's Office and I would try to explain all the things that the Comptroller's Office does in a way that's more understandable to our citizens because frankly right now as I've been running, the number of people who are like, what is a Comptroller? They don't understand. It's not an office they're going to call up the way they call up their city council member. And I think it's an important office, an office that helps drive equity with some of the policies that they do when people want to access contracts. And a lot of people don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. League of Women Voters, I believe, has been one of the uh, most prominent supporters of ranked choice voting. Yes. Uh, you know, we've been asking these candidates, uh, are, well, <laughs> I should say, assuming that you are a supporter of ranked choice voting with, yes. with that, you know, tell us uh, what have you been doing to, to spread the word, you know, or do you think that it will be uh, used equitably? Uh, adopted equitably, and uh, oh, and also who's going to be on your ballot? Sure. So um, I'm, I'm really excited that you asked that question because I, am, you know, I became a volunteer with the league because I believe in good government, right? And in two years ago, I was out talking to people, talking about ranked choice voting, really thinking that it was something we needed in our city government so we have more representation and new voices can be heard, right? The last time New York City had ranked choice voting in 1937, we had our first woman elected to city council. We had our first African-American elected to city council. And we've seen what it's done in California and Maine, right? Um, but now after, and at that time I had no idea I was gonna run, right? Now I'm running and I'm talking to people and I'm also talking really, you know, my base is immigrant communities in, you know, Queens and Brooklyn and the Bronx. And when I go to those neighborhoods and I talk to people, it's hard, people don't understand uh, ranked choice voting. And I mean, I can speak the languages too. So it's not even a matter of language access in a lot of these cases, right? But people are like, well, we just want to put you one. Why should, you know, and trying to explain to them. And I think that I'm worried, I'm worried that the Board of Elections doesn't have the, the machine system set up. I believe that um, I wanted this to be an election where we had 
New York City was going to be an example of good government, right? With the eight times matching, with the ranked choice voting. And my own experience now is maybe it's not going to work out so well because there was a lot of confusion around ranked choice voting, especially in immigrant communities and communities of color um, who don't understand why they even have to do this. And I think we need better education. And have you given thought to who you would rank on your personal ballot? Yeah. Well, I was honored to hear when I was waiting that Brad <laughs> is uh, putting me as number two. You know, um, he has been a wonderful ally for women, for immigrants, for people of color. And, you know, with the Excluded Workers Act, you know, he was out there uh, fasting with everyone else. So I deeply admire his commitment to these uh, values. Um, and so I will be putting him number two. And at the same time, you know, I've been impressed by a lot of the other people running and you know this is an amazing diverse group of people representing diverse parts of the city and parts of the city where I've done work and you know members of their communities and so I'll be you know thinking about how I rank everyone else as well and you know my belief in rank choice voting and you know, I will definitely be ranking five people. You're going all the way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go because again I, I fought for rank choice voting you know so I want to make sure that it works. You've done a lot clearly with communities uh, and with finance. Yes. What about the arts? <laughs> we're, we're at an, an arts and cultural yes. institution here. What can you, with your background, do for arts and culture in New York City that can help bring it back? Sure. Well, thank you for that question. I'm, I can't tell you how excited I am to be in the Kaufman Concert Hall because I've been in the audience so many times and seen so many amazing um, speakers here. Um, I am deeply committed to the arts. I live in New York City because of the arts and culture. I serve currently on the board of Dance NYC, which is a service organization for dance artists around the city. I have also founded and produced plays through a nonprofit theater company called Alter Ego Productions. I'm doing very local theater in New York City uh, back when we could and back when theater space was affordable. Um, which in the last few years I had not become affordable to do these kind of off off Broadway plays. Uh, so you know, during the uh, pandemic, uh, w one of the things that I helped do was review applications for the COVID relief fund that Dance NYC started. I mean, within two weeks, they managed to raise five hundred, you know, thousand dollars to help dance artists, and we were giving out grants. And you know, just reading those applications, how many of these artists really, you know, lost their livelihood? Performances just canceled. The thing you've been waiting for your whole life now it's canceled, and you don't qualify for unemployment. There's no COVID relief for you because you don't have that paperwork. You didn't have that income to even show from before. Like this was your first big break. Um, and I think sorry to cut you there. I do okay. just want to give you a chance to uh, make a closing statement. We're running out of time now. Oh, okay. And, I apologize. Uh, I by all means, no, bring it around to, uh, yeah. to everything. I just want to say that I love the arts and committed to it. Um, sure. You know, I'm running for New York City Comptroller because I believe that we need to be doing things differently. We need new voices in our city government and we need people who have financial expertise, which I have, but also understand community needs. And through my volunteer work, I've kind of crisscrossed the city and seen the lived experiences of many different New Yorkers. And I believe that they want to have a bigger voice in city government, and I hope to represent them if and when I'm elected comptroller. Thanks very much. I really appreciate your coming in. All right. Rashma Patel. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And next, New York Assembly member David Weprin joins us. Good to see you again. Good to see you, James. How are you? Good. Mm -hmm. Jeff. Thank you for joining us. My, my pleasure. Now, you've been involved in politics for a very long time, as has your family, yeah. uh, and uh, are a name that uh, the, the family name, one that many people uh, can identify with from a long history. Talk about what new, what difference you would bring to this position. What does that background, how does that give us a fresh approach to, if at all, to the comptroller job? Well, you know, we're going to be in a tough uh, fiscal situation for a number of years. I mean, everybody was focused on this year. And of course, we got, uh, you know, $6 billion or more, uh, actually more if you count all the other uh, dollars, but $6 billion uh, in budget relief specifically uh, for New York City and then, you know, another uh, package for New York State. So we're not going to have a fiscal crisis with the budget this coming year, but we will in the out years for the next uh, possibly four or five years with multi-billion dollar deficits. It's a very challenging time in our city. And of course, we've been devastated by the pandemic. Uh, we really have to bring the city back. I'm very concerned about uh, the future of the city. I've lived in New York City my entire life. Uh, I, I love New York City and uh, I feel I can make uh, a substantial contribution uh, as controller at this very difficult time 
uh, in our city's history. And do you feel that the comptroller position, how does it differ from positions that you've held prior to this point? Well, you know, I know I know the position very well um, because um, I had uh, a 25-year uh, municipal finance career on Wall Street, and I've always d dealt with the uh, city of New York, uh, which is the uh, premier client uh, of any uh, underwriting firm. And I've been with six separate underwriting firms, uh, including a, a woman-owned firm. Uh, so uh, I know uh, the debt issuance function. You know, we, we floated bonds uh, for infrastructure, uh, for housing, for health care. Uh, for schools. Uh, so, uh, you know, I know uh, the debt issuance functioning. I know structuring of bond issues and uh, you know, refundings and uh, various uh, ways to uh, save money. Uh, so the controller has a lot of different functions, and I feel um, I've got a background uh, in, in many of those uh, areas, uh, particularly uh, the debt issuance. Um, you know, I certainly will take the fiduciary responsibility of investing the pension funds uh, very seriously. Uh, I think the primary responsibility uh, should be uh, to get the uh, best returns on the on the assets. Uh, so that will be uh, my primary driving force uh, with the anticipated uh, fiscal deficits coming up. Uh, I think it's important that we get uh, at least 7 percent, uh, hopefully a lot more than 7 percent uh, in our returns uh, on the assets, because uh, obviously, as you know, if we don't achieve 7 percent, uh, we the city of New York has to make up the difference. And that could result in potential budget cuts, uh, in um, you know, in, in deficits. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm concerned about that, uh, and I think uh, that's an important function. You do know the job. In fact, you you've run for it before in 2009. Uh, that 2009 campaign, the the authorities found that uh, committed some various campaign finance violations. You ended up having to pay a $28,000 fine, and uh, in fact, until recently. Um, had only recently paid back three hundred twenty thousand dollars in in public funds that you had you had owed for for nearly a decade. Uh, look, controller is a job about uh, overseeing public financing and accountability of, of the city government. You know why should voters trust you uh, with these violations and this outstanding fine for so long? Well, actually, it was never against me. Uh, it was pretty clear by uh, campaign finance board. It was against uh, what was then a defunct committee. Uh, after a, an, an audit uh, way post uh, the election, uh, and it specifically said uh, that if I was going to run uh, for citywide office again uh, and seek matching funds, it had to be paid back. Uh, and I actually uh, worked with the campaign finance board about the way to do that. Uh, we complied with uh, everything uh, that they suggested, uh, and we paid it back before I announced uh, last year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Should voters be be concerned. I mean, were, you know, were, were there were there rules that I suppose that you were you were violating in that ca campaign that resulted in in the these fines and having to pay back the public funds? No, it was you know it was it as was, it was part of a campaign. There was a question uh, uh, about how uh, certain you know things were were calculated and, and whether there was an overpayment or not an overpayment. We actually disputed it, and uh, this was an overall settlement. And the settlement was pretty clear that it wasn't against me personally, it was against a defunct committee, and that if I was going to uh, run again uh, for city office, uh, that it would have to be paid back uh, before I'd be eligible for matching funds. So I, again, uh, this was part of an overall settlement. We had uh, detailed discussions about, about it, and I fully complied uh, with the guidance. Right, but it was paid in, in December, you said, of, of 2020. Correct. But it, it was but it, paid. It might have been November, but it was paid before I announced. Right. It. Okay. But but it's a an amount that had been accrued back in 2000. I I don't remember how years before. Can you talk about that that lag of time? Well, as I said, um, it was it was a disputed uh, situation. Uh, it was um, about whether uh, there was overpayment, and it was based on uh, you know. Uh, calculation, how they calculated it, and the campaign finance boards were the ones that determined uh, how much should be paid or not, uh, and it was against uh, the committee. It wasn't against me personally, uh, and uh, it was complied with, and uh, we paid it back uh, before applying for matching funds again. Uh, the 92nd Street Y uh, is an arts and cultural powerhouse, <laughs> uh, and certainly has those interests well at heart. Can you talk about how those interests stack up for you and what commitment 
and what actions you would take to bolster the arts and culture communities of New York as comptroller? I actually, when I chaired the Finance Committee of the City Council for eight years, uh, I was a huge champion for the arts. And uh, I championed the arts for a lot of reasons. It wasn't just strictly uh, that the arts made uh, New York City the greatest city in the world, which it did, but it was really an economic uh, analysis as well. Uh, because I don't know if you remember the, um, the Gates in Central Park, uh, Christo and John Claude, uh, that whole uh, millions of dollars investments, and uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg himself was, uh, was against it uh, if the city had to put up the money. Uh, and at the time, uh, they said they would pay for it. It wouldn't cost the city anything. But the city probably should have put up the money because the economic activity and revenue we got in, uh, in taxes uh, and outside economic activity were tenfold uh, from what was actually spent. So it really made economic sense. And I think we have to, uh, to bring culture back uh, we have to look at it from different ways of looking at it, but one way is certainly economic activity, uh, and that's really what produces the revenue uh, for our tax base uh, in New York City. And you're identified a lot with an outer borough, uh, but if you could talk about how uh, the how your office could help Broadway, Harlem, and Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island. How, how can it help the five boroughs from an arts and cultural perspective? Well, one of the things I've been saying everywhere is I'm committed to opening up uh, an office in every borough. Right now, there's only one office of the controller, which is in the municipal building uh, downtown, the David Dinkins uh, uh, building. And, um, you know, I think we're a five-borough city. I think we should be a five-borough controller's office. And I'd like specifically to use those borough offices uh, to work with the various communities, work with small businesses, uh, work, work with culture and the arts uh, to kind of help bring the city back. And there's a lot of money uh, that's available that people aren't aware of from various programs, from the federal government, from the state government, uh, from the city government, uh, post-pandemic. And I would like to use those borough offices uh, to focus uh, on helping small businesses, helping MWBE businesses uh, come back uh, and benefit from some of those programs. This is the first year of ranked choice voting. Of course, it will be uh, applied to your race. Uh, wondering if you are a supporter of RCV and uh, you know whether or not if, if you have any uh, concerns about how it's being implemented this year. Well, uh, I was a supporter. I, I uh, signed uh, various letters early on uh, before it was uh, voted on and established. Uh, my main concern was to save uh, the taxpayers uh, a lot of money in a runoff which could be costly and uh, not paid much attention to and uh, would not get a big turnout. So that was one of my primary concerns was to uh, avoid the expense of the runoff. Um, uh, I'm a little nervous about the Board of Elections uh, because of some of the past history of being, uh, being ready in June with uh, so many uh, races going on. But time will tell. But uh, overall, I thought it was a good thing because it saved uh, the city of New York a lot of money. Uh, and uh, in eliminated a, a costly runoff, which often resulted in a low turnout. And briefly, uh, who will you rank number two? I have not decided yet. I'm concentrating on uh, Weprin as number one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've got time for a closing statement, if you please. Yes, thank you. You know, uh, I'm running uh, for New York City controller uh, to put the needs of uh, working class and middle class families front and center uh, and to invest the uh, money of our over 700,000 retirees uh, and those are retirees uh, like my 91-year-old uh, mother, uh, who is a Cuban Jewish immigrant uh, to this country. She came here at the age of eight. She didn't speak a word of English. She went to our public schools. Uh, she went to CUNY, where she met my father. Uh, she uh, became a teacher, and now she's relying on her teacher's pension. Uh, I also feel I have the relevant finance experience, both public and private sector finance experience, to help bring back the city uh, and to help us get, get us out of this uh, fiscal crisis that we're going to be in for probably the next uh, three, four, five years, uh, particularly uh, as chair of the Finance Committee, I balanced uh, eight consecutive budgets during two major fiscal crises right after 9-11 and during the 2008 uh, recession. Uh, so I really feel I, I can make a good contribution, a great contribution uh, to the city that, uh, that I love and that I've lived in my entire life. That's why I'm running for controller. Assemblyman David Weprin, thank you so much for, for joining us. Really thank you. It. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Well said. Thank you. This marks the conclusion of our controller candidates forum.
There remains, of course, so much more ground that we could cover, but we have greatly appreciated the time of all of the candidates and the opportunity that they've provided to us to understand their many positions and proposals on key issues facing our city. Thank you to all of the candidates for joining us and sharing their time so close to the June 22nd primary. Thank you also to our amazing co-moderators, Jeff Colton and James Ford, and our media partners, City and State New York and PIX11. And thank you to all of you, our 92nd Street Y patrons, for supporting the Race to City Hall series. We hope you'll join us for our upcoming events, which include a virtual forum with the Manhattan Borough President candidates on June 3rd at 7 p.m., and an in-person mayoral forum featuring candidates and a live audience from the stage of the 92nd Street Y's Kaufman Concert Hall on June 7th at 7 p.m. For more information on these and other programs, please visit our website, 92y.org. We hope you enjoyed the program and thank you for your participation.